All right, so a couple quick announcements. If you haven't already, make sure you sign in at geofsit.org slash sign in. Um, and then also, uh, upcoming meetings. Tomorrow is the red team meeting, uh, Friday at 6.30, upstairs on the third floor. Uh, blue team meeting is on Monday at 6.30, upstairs on the third floor. And then we have a CTF uh, this Saturday. If you want to learn more about that, join the Slack channel, you have tax Colonel Sanders. Um, and if you're interested in lecturing, DM either our president, Daniel Chalco, or our vice president, Nozomi. Um, and then we also have a conference coming up called B-Sides Tampa. If you want to learn more about that and going to it, join the Slack channel, SIT Conferences. Um, so I do want to say something real quick. If you're interested in lecturing and you think, oh man, I just maybe don't know enough, trust me, you probably do. You don't have to be an expert in anything. You just have to, you know, um, try to put yourself in an uncomfortable position, you know, and take this you know, awesome opportunity to lecture and teach us about something cool and scary. So if you're interested, uh, you can thank either one of us and uh, hope to see to get some response. And, you know, John's presenting today, so. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, command and control, also known as C2, and just sort of going with the basics of that. Um, I'm sure there's quite a few here who have never heard of command and control or what that means. That's okay, I'm going to go over that. So this is what a basic attacker's methodology looks like in terms of um, either a red team or an actual you know, state-sponsored attack. So, you have first the recon, which is basically just trying to figure out ways to get into a potential network, company, website, anything like that. Then you have the initial compromise, which is you uh, finding um, basically an exploit that you can use um, or some sort of way into the network that gets you in there. Um, and then you establish persistence, basically allows you to, once you're on the network, a way to, like, for you to be able to stay on that network without being kicked off. Um, and then there's this whole little circular process here um, where you're basically trying to escalate your privileges if you got in as like, and you're a normal employee user, but you're trying to become an administrator, you'd escalate that way. There's internal recon where you're trying to like find more information about stuff on the network. And then lateral movement, you're trying to spread across the network. And then data analysis, you're basically trying to look for passwords, credit card info, stuff like that. That whole cycle there is um, basically where command and control comes in, uh, which is what we're gonna be talking about. It's essentially, if you were to get um, if you were to compromise a computer on a company's network, right? And let's say you wanted, now that you've compromised it, you want to send commands to that computer so it can execute it and then send the output back to you. So you want to basically, if you wanted to get the, um, you know, a list of password files or um, credit card info that's on that computer, you also have to send a command to it so that it can get that and then send it back to you. And you do that uh, through command and control. So command and control basically defines that process of setting the command and uh, receiving the output from that command. So what exactly is command and control? Uh, like pretty much I just said, defines the process attackers take in communicating with already infected computers. So um, a C2 server, which is a command and control server, um, is in charge of this whole process. It sends commands to the compromised system and gets back the data from that system, whether it be passwords, credit card info, stuff like that. Um, and then botnets, I'm sure you guys are all are familiar with at least what I already have heard of botnets. Uh, they're known, pretty well known for using C2 servers for basically controlling all of the infected machines that they have control over. Because um, it makes it basically, C2 isn't the most practical if you're just, um, well it can be, but it's more useful if you have infected multiple machines. If you just have one machine, it's like, it's C2 server is supposed to be used to make it more efficient for you to send commands to a large number of computers at once and receive data back from those computers. Yeah. So I have a, I have a question. Um, so I already infected these machines, and like, why would I ever use C2? Why wouldn't I just like log on to log into them or like create a reverse, reverse shell? Like, why are the cool kids doing C2 now and not like? Just logging into them. Right. Uh, so part is what I, what I just said, basically, where uh, let's say um, you wanted to just log into the computer and just control it that way. You could, but let's say you've infected like 100 computers. You're not going to do that with 100 computers. It's just not feasible. A C2 server lets you basically send one command that will go to all those computers at once. Um, another thing is that C2 servers are also a bit more stealthy because, um, like I'll, I'll explain later, but basically what's happening is an infected computer, when it's initially infected, 
it's going to beacon out to my, it's going to try to talk to my C2 server and request a command to, uh, to execute, essentially. Um, and so with that, you can have it set so it's only uh, beaconing out to the C2 server maybe once a day, once every few hours. Um, but if you had just had logged in on the computer, then there's constant traffic being like shown on the network, and so it's much easier to get caught that way. But if you with C2, if you just have an infected machine that's only requesting a, only sending out um, basically um, a transmission to the C2 server once a day, that's a lot less noise on the network, and so you're much less likely to get caught. So um, how C2 works? So um, the big computer is initially infected with malware. It could be through um, an email or they're going to a website, anything like that. Um, and then once they're infected, the big computer beacons out to the C2 server, requesting a command to be executed. Um, then the C2 server will provide a command to be executed by the big computer. Then the big computer executes that command and sends the output back to the C2 server. And then that process is just basically cycles over and over again. Where the uh, infected computer will constantly be beaking it out, asking for uh, a command, and the C2 server will then provide it to be executed, send back the output, and just keep going. So that's basically how, um, in the most basic form, how command and control works. And if anyone has any questions throughout this, please raise your hand. I'll be glad to answer. So how is bad C2 detected? So badly made C2. So when an infected computer beacons out to the C2 server, it can do so through various means of communication, um, but many of these ways can be easily detected by antivirus and virals these days. Uh, one example is like old C2 uh, methods use something called IRC, um, which is the Internet Relay Channel. Um, however, if you try to do that today on an actual company network, that would instantly get blocked and flagged as malicious traffic, because if let's say let's say I'm a employee for a company, and so, and like the network. Um, engineer is viewing all my traffic, and they see that my computer is connecting to an IRC port. It's like no normal employee just connects to an IRC. That's not that's not normal traffic, and so it's going to get flagged and it's going to be seen as malicious. So that's how bad C2 is detected. If you're using like um, basically trying to go through a channel that is not commonly used by employees of a company. So for hiding your C2 traffic. Um, so because of this, malware had to adapt to use more common channels in order to hide its traffic once normal user traffic, uh, such as HTTP. Uh, pretty much everyone here, and every, definitely everyone on a company network, connects to websites, goes to websites. If you're browsing any sort of website online, you're using HTTP and HTTPS. Right? That's how basically um, web servers work. Um, so HTTP traffic is, most, is mostly unfiltered in company networks. Uh, so infected computers are able to send requests to a C2 server through ports 80 and 443. Uh, ports 80 and 443 are, um, are the ports that are used by HTTP and HTTPS. So essentially, you're basically just sending it as web traffic, and so it's just a bunch of noise with a bunch of other uh, web traffic that every employee in the company is sending out. So that's how um, better C2 hides its traffic. So it's kind of a cat and mouse game, where malware adapts to being to be able to use uh, more common forms of uh, communication like HTTP, and then uh, the, like the defensive side, they tighten their restrictions, right? So companies had to start putting tougher restrictions on the web traffic, uh, blocking sites that didn't match certain criteria, or even whitelisting altogether. Um, whitelisting means that basically, if you're in a company's network and you try to browse the web, you're only allowed to go to a certain number of sites, all of the sites are blocked, um, that's good security-wise because it basically means that you're not able to go to like my malicious website because it, it'll just block it; it won't allow it. Um, but again, malware adapted, and so to combat this, uh, they became more sophisticated, more sophisticated um, in their approach in, ter in terms of receiving and sending commands. Uh, so nowadays, you'll see um, common malware using actually using communication for sites that actually are whitelisted or are going to be most likely whitelisted, such as Gmail, Twitter, and even Instagram. So like, if you're on a company network, you're not allowed to go to you know, thisevilsite.com because it's going to get blocked. However, the company's going to let you go to gmail.com, right? So I can now set up my, my C2 traffic to go through Gmail or Twitter or Instagram. Um, and that's what I'll be going into a little bit later on, is how um, I developed 
I built a tool uh, for actually using Spotify to send command and control traffic. So yeah, a new method of command and control called Spotify C2. Um, it's just a proof of concept. I wouldn't even consider it a tool. It's just to show that it works. Um, so it's just to show that even the most popular music app, Spotify, can be used as a means for command and control. Because uh, most companies will allow Spotify because everyone likes to listen to music on the, when they're working. Um, so it basically it auto generates playlists that contain a command written acrostically in a list of songs. So you can see here where I've circled in red, that's actually the beginning of a command. Um, cat is like a common like uh, command to like uh, show the the show what's inside a file, show the contents of a file. Um, and you see that it's like literally an acrostic inside of a, a public Spotify playlist. So um, how is it able to send the commands? So when the infected machine is beaconing out for a command, um, it actually makes a request using the Spotify API to get a list of playlists associated with the user account that I created. Right? So I, if I created a, um, if I have a Spotify account and I create a public playlist and it has the command hidden inside the songs, the infected machine will make a request to Spotify asking for a list of all the playlists that I created. Right? And then it's going to go through each playlist and grab the first letter from each song and put that all together to form a command. And then that command is executed. All right. Anyone have any questions? Because I know it's a little bit confusing. We got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So yeah. So when you're doing, when you're creating like a acrostic in Spotify, special characters. There's no song that starts with a special character or numbers, unfortunately. So I had to use sort of, I like, I wouldn't call it encoding. It's more of just like um, a space was I re I um, I reassigned it to be the word f space, and then um, with like a slash, I called it like e slash. So essentially, I, I renamed it to actual words, but words that I knew were not going to be common in uh, the commands. Because if you change, like, if I change space to, like, cat, then that could be interpreted as a command and not actually, you know, a space, for example. So, yeah, I just basically reassigned it to words that weren't going to be commonly used in commands. So, like, f space, e slash, uh, e backslash, stuff like that. And that it makes her a longer acrostic, because obviously, you're changing one character to like four or five, but um, actually this playlist lets you make up to 10,000 songs, so it wasn't really an issue. But yeah, that's how I was able to get around the, the special characters. So retrieving the output. Um, so the output from the commands um, are often much longer than the command itself. So if I were to run like, um, running uh, you know, a command that says, Give me the content of this file. Uh, that's usually like really short. It's like you know cat uh, password file, right? So it's the command itself is very short. The output from that command can be very long, and so it wasn't feasible to store all that inside an acrostic for a song. Wait, yeah. What's an acrostic? So an acrostic is um, I'll go back here. It's this where you basically have a like multiple sort of. Uh, I guess sentences, and then the first letter from each one makes an actual word. That's what an acrostic is. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. So it wasn't feasible to store the output of like uh, of like Etsy password into a uh, into an acrostic for songs because it's just way too long. Uh, so what I did was I encoded it with something called Base64. For those who don't know, Base64 is like a common encoding, um, and then. I encoded it, and then each playlist has a description box as well. So I put the base64 encoded output from the command into the description box of the playlist. Um, however, I came across another issue. The description box is only 300 characters long, and a lot of time my base64 encode output was much longer than uh, 300 characters. So I basically had to create new playlists, as you can see here on the left-hand side. I created a bunch more playlists uh, with um, basically a chunk of the base64 encoded output into it. Which I know this part can be confusing, so if you guys have any questions about this, feel free to ask. But I basically, like, the output that I got from the infected machine, I base64 encoded it, and it was, like, really long. So I split it into chunks and then put it into the description of a bunch of playlists. 
So once I did that, it was basically as easy as um, I'm on my, my actual computer, not on the infected machine. I just um, queried that, uh, the playlist, and then put all the base64 output together, decode it, and then I get the actual output of the command. And now I'm going to show a, a quick demo. Oh yeah, question. That's a good point. So the reason why I did do that is because um, in terms of trying to stay the most stealth as I could, if let's say a network um, engineer is seeing weird traffic coming out of your uh, a com an employee's network, right? And they want to check it out. They see that they can a lot of parts of Spotify. Maybe first you would uh, never you probably wouldn't even think anything of it. But let's say they did. They want to check out what requests are happening, and then they find a playlist. If you find a playlist that has that looks like this, I mean, besides I can change the file name to something that's like you know not suspicious. But you wouldn't think that oh well, this first letter of each of these songs is forming command. That's not the first thing that comes to your head. But if they saw the, the description here and they saw a, like a Windows command, they'd get very suspicious and they'd probably think that something was up. So it's just another way of staying, you know, under the radar of the blue team. And from Spotify. And from Spotify, exactly. Yeah. Oh, uh, why do the title names look weird? Uh, just so the yeah. description and the title names look different, right? So this is something I could have done better on because this does look suspicious. <laughs> um, but again, it's not like, it, this, the requests that are being made here are coming from my computer that isn't being, not from the employee's computer, it's coming from like my actual computer. It's not being like, you know, checked on. Uh, but I could have done better, yeah, with the, um, the naming of these playlists. It was just, it helped me re put the base 64 uh, chunks back together. Uh, because the first, the really long playlist name you see there is actually the ID of the playlist of the original command. And then the number after that is just um, what number of playlists it is in the chunk. So that's a 29th chunk of base64 encoded data. And so using that, I was able to just um, put it all back together again because they're all just in a certain order. Uh, but yeah, uh, if I was rethinking this, I'd probably do a better job at not having it in the playlist name. Yeah. Uh, did you ever consider like encoding data in the playlist name? No, I haven't thought of that. That actually. That actually would be a good idea as well, because um, they let you set the, uh, like, upload an image for that, right? You could, like, encode, like, the actual output into the entire image, if it's just a single file file. So you mean, like, hiding the inside image and uploading it to the profile picture of the playlist? Yeah. yeah, that's actually really good as well. I could just do, I, that would have been a better idea, actually, just doing that. Although, I don't know what the file size limit on, is, on that is, so it might not be able to upload a one profile picture. You might have to do a couple. Yeah, like two or three, yeah, yeah, but that's a good idea. All right, so the quick demo. So right now, um, here you can, I have just an empty Spotify playlist. I'm just signing with a normal free account. No playlist created at the moment. Uh, this is, this, I'm currently now here on my, um, my hacker machine, my attacking machine. And I'm gonna run the, um, my tool that's basically gonna run, let me, Um, I'm running my tool that's going to generate the acrostic. I actually added a kind of fun feature where you can choose the genre that the acrostic uh, creates. So I chose rock. So the acrostic will be generate a bunch of rock songs. Um, and then I'm entering the command here that I want to be executed on the infected computer. Uh, dir, which in Windows is just a common command to list all the files in your current folder. And then I'm entering a playlist name. That doesn't matter. I can, enter, I can call whatever I want. And now you can see here that it's generated the acrostic. So if you look at the first letter of each one, it spells out dir. And now that's been added to my uh, Spotify playlist. I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'll add another command. Uh, I'll just do who am I, which is a common command again on both Linux and Windows that tells you what user you currently are on the system. And again, it generates the acrostic. And now I'm currently, this is the infected, this is the employee's machine. And as you can see right here, this is the uh, the back door that would be theoretically on the employee's machine. And then when you execute it, you're not going to get any output because you don't want any output on the victim's machine because the employee doesn't want to see any of this. And you don't want them to see any of this. 
And now I'm gonna go back here and you can see here that now the playlists have been created. Um, the who playlist is the one for who am I, the get file is the endure one. And then the two here are the, um, the output from the, um, from the dir command. The who am I one, you didn't need to create any extra ones because, of, because the command is, the output from the command is really tiny. But the, uh, the dir one produces a bit more output, so you need to create more playlists to fit it in there. Yeah, you can see that the acrostic is made in. And the same for who am I. And then you can see here in the description box is the uh, base64 encoded output. So if I go back to my attacker machine and I run the script, uh, the tool that gets the output from that, it's querying the Spotify playlist and putting it back together in base64 decoding it. And you can see here that we get the command that was executed, the output from it, and then the other command, who am I, and the output from that. And then I also, just for cleanup wise, I, uh, it deletes the playlist, so it's no longer there anymore. So any questions on command and control in general, or maybe specifically what I did with uh, Spotify? Yeah. Is this specific to Spotify or other uh, music apps exploitable in the same way? So this tool is only for Spotify. Um, I imagine you can do the same thing with um, Apple Music, Amazon Music, anything that lets you create a playlist or edit something that is public to other people that can put, you can put data on it. But yeah, this one was specifically for Spotify. Oh, you got another question? Yeah. So The infected computer. Okay. Yeah. So are they so, also on their playlist here? Uh, no. So it's 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 one user account that they're creating it on. Uh, so yes, it would be on. Would it, well, it would have to be on. So it would have to be on the employee's um, Spotify account. It'd be on the Spotify account that I sent initially with the back door. It's just using that one. So yeah, the, like the employee wouldn't see these playlists on their on their account. You could theoretically have two accounts. Just yeah. Exactly. Um, and you, so you basically have one account, which is, I guess, the employee's account, which is already there, and then my account, which they won't be able to see because it's just running in the background. So I have a question. Are you using Spotify over Twitter? Yeah, so um, the main reason is because Twitter and something Instagram has already been done before. I just wanted to try to see if I could do another one. So I sort of added Spotify to that sort of list of all the social medias and most random stuff that you could use command and control for. Um, yeah, actually, our one of the members of our club last year did a talk on using Twitter for command and control, um, Terry. So this is sort of the inspiration from that to sort of add to the uh, the craziness of what you can do with command and control, and the weirdest way you can send commands. I want to see MySpace next year, OK? <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's another question. So we'll do a quick exercise that's not Super related to, it's related to malware in general, but it's not like specifically necessarily a command and control. Um, it uses a tool called Wireshark. For those who don't know, uh, Wireshark is a um, packet sniffer. Um, basically, if you're, if you're on a network and um, you pull up Wireshark on your computer and you make requests to, um, you can go to google.com or anything like that, all those packets will show up on Wireshark and you can see the exact, like, Requests being made, the data being sent, all the specifics of it. Um, and so we're going to use that to try to analyze um, what malware is currently running on a system. So if you go to that link and then download the, uh, there's uh, three zip files there. It's a, one has PCAPs, one has some alert files, and one has some email files on it. Um, and then there's a, there's a few questions on there. Um, if you try to, Using the PCAP and Wireshark, um, try to answer the questions. For those who know, PCAP is a, um, is, I guess, is a, stands for, I guess, packet capture. It's basically just the, uh, the file type that you use for packet capture. So Wireshark can read PCAP files, essentially. Oh, you can also log on to NDP, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, so you, what's the, the site? ndg.cic.ufl.edu. Yeah, you have to go to the site ndg.cic.ufl.edu. You want to use those pods. Um, 
to download the Wireshark because you probably don't want to download on your own laptop if you. There's already Wireshark on those machines. So yeah, go to ndg.cic.ufl.edu. Oh, right. login is like. For the login, uh, the username is sit, and the password is. No, the username it's like the username sit, and then the let the the letter and number that are on that are in front of you on that computer. That so little we, sticker that's on the uh, yeah. the monitor. So it would be it would be like sit G one for example. A little white sticker that's underneath the monitor. And the password is. <laughs> Lol. One, two, three, four, period? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it's not C. Yeah, it's just like C. Yeah, that works. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the password for the P PCAPs is infected. Yes, thank you. The password to unlock the zip file is infected. And there is an answer zip file there. If you can refrain from reading that before trying out the challenge. And if anyone's having any issues with NDG, um, like logging into it, let me know, and I'll come around and help. And so we'll zone. It'll be cool. Seat now, yeah, seat now. And letter. No, no, no. Did you use the Spotify API for the genre function? For the genre? No, I had a. So I had like a list of about 10,000 songs. Yeah. And they were separated by genre. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're only using those 10,000 songs. It's root and sit. Oh, it's sit? Uh, what is it? Root. Yeah, yeah. 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 So this actually gets like nothing. So yeah. if you were you 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 you're doing it. Oh, it's the Kelly exactly. username. It's root and so sit. Is, is so username root, root password sit. So you won't know you wouldn't know this. Right. And you can you can monitor eighty four four three and look at what the request, but even the Spotify is not. So you're just gonna see a Spotify request and there's no thing in here. Alright. So it's a lot harder to sort of so, uh, to detect. Now if you're using a VPN, mm -hmm. have you 
for your connection because uh, if your connection is right, does that help them? Uh, so it wouldn't because um, that would that would help with like preventing yourself from getting um, infected in the first place. Right. But what, if you're already infected, once you're infected, so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But actually, yeah, yeah. 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 you can definitely help with preventing. I'm watching. Yeah. I'm watching. Uh, I'm and watching ports. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's like a, I don't know, I got the little snitch. Little pad up there. Yeah. What is that? Check it out. Google that. Little snitch. One of my best invests. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's something that there's a, something inside you want to call home, especially dot ru. You know what's going on. I love that. I, but I don't know what you know. So I'm, why I'm telling you this. Uh, oh, plus you can get a high version of it. So you don't even. Yeah, it is. It's a and I, I'm asking you because that's what I'm between the VPN and the snitch on a Mac. I feel confident, but I'd like to know that somebody like you. Right. Am I? Yeah, I would say. Am I miss? Uh, am I? I don't know what I don't know. Right. Not exactly. Uh, that's why I'm coming here. Yeah, yeah. So I actually, I've also done all my life, and I just, 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 I
Do you have your ACMI adapter? Yeah, can I get that? I'm going to go over a wire shark right now uh, in a minute here, just to sort of go over the basics of wire shark and going through uh, a couple of the tasks that it's asking. So, who's in line? I'm in line, yeah. Wait, how do I? I'm getting it. I just plug it in here and I can still it on the screen. Yeah, just do it through any GFN. So you can do the same thing because that, that thing is old AF. Okay, so I'm going to here. Oh. Are you really? Okay. Yeah. I, I but it's faster on here. Whatever you want to do. I'll do it on Okay, okay. Because okay. I already have a little file sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it won't be recorded then. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, this is just. Thank you. Should I stop the recording or? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think like I think we just record the lecture part. The exercise doesn't make any sense. Hmm? Uh, yeah, on the website it tells you the question. Say bye, John. Bye, John. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, how do I show my screen? Uh, here. John's going to go over what to do since uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion on how to use Wireshark. Okay. He's pissing out hard. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's or so. Yeah. It's either the issue lines. Or it could be like this or, thing. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. And then, uh, Let's see if that's any better. And if not, then I can just see. Oh, oh okay. thank you. No okay. problem. Cool. Okay, so. Yeah, has everyone downloaded the, uh, the zip files? If you haven't, raise your hand and I can give you that. Okay. 
download that. All right, if you download the zip file, um, you want to go into the, uh, the PCAPs one, the one that has the, uh, the .pcap file extensions, and you want to open those in Wireshark. Um, so if you're on the Kali box, you want to, I'm going to open up Wireshark. You want to open up Wireshark first. Um, who doesn't have Wireshark open right now? Okay. So um, once you have Wireshark open, you want to do um, file, and then you want to do open, and then you want to look for the, the, the part one uh, PCAP. So part dash one dot PCAP and whatever else is before it. Uh, just to open it up. And then you should see something similar to this. Full screen on it. So you just see something similar to this. Um, is everyone at this point able to see open up a PCAP file? If you're not, raise your hand and I can help you. Yeah. Yeah. Open with the PCAP file. So these are the questions. That I sort of like, that I want you to answer essentially. Let me see if I can zoom in here. So I want you to first find out what a uh, date and time did the infection activity start. Uh, so basically, like when did the initial infection occur? So um, I guess I'll go through and explain why I a bit. I'm not an expert on why I by any means, um, but it shows basically. A packet capture of network traffic on a network. This isn't live right now. So this isn't like this has been captured like many months ago, and it's just been stored into a file. And now we're reading through those packets. Um, so a little, I'll just go through sort of the uh, the formatting of this wire right here. So um, on the left hand side here, it shows the time uh, from like the, the very first packet is starting out at zero, and then it just goes like. How many seconds after that did the next packet come, and so on and so so forth. Um, this here is the um, the source IP that the packet came from, and then right next to that is the destination IP that it was going to. So the packet, in this case, the packet that I highlighted here, um, was being sent from the IP 172.16.2.197, and it was being sent to 255.255.255.255. Um, here shows the protocol. Um, the protocol is basically similar to how I was talking before about HTTP and HTTPS. HTTP is a protocol, um, and so this just shows you the different protocols that the protocol specifically that that packet used to send the data. Um, so if you look at the green ones here, um, there's TCP. You can even see the HTTP protocol on this one here. So that one's actually really interesting because we mostly are going to be looking at just the HTTP traffic um, on these packets. Um, so anything you see like that's in blue or yellow, 
we can ignore the green stuff is what we really want because it shows the interesting stuff. Um, so you can hear with the HTTP one, um, it was sent from the IP, this IP here, 172.16.2.197, and it was uh, sent to 23.48.32.40. And you can see it was a uh, get request to for a file called ncsi.txt. Uh, that's just show an example of the sort of information you get out of Wireshark. Um, so what we want to do here is figure out what time did the infection activity start. So um, if I see get if I see an HTTP request, first thing I want to do is inspect it. So I want to see the full thing. So to do that in Wireshark, you right click on it, click go to follow, and then do follow TCP stream. And it's this one is very short. Um, usually they're quite a bit longer, or they can be. Um, so this is just showing me get request to um, for that file. So it's basically trying to view what's in NCSI on TXT. So nothing interesting here. Um, nothing that really we care about. So we're going to close that. And once you close, when you do follow TCP, TCP stream, it does an automatic filter at the top here. To go back to the original, you just have to delete that filter and then hit enter, and it'll bring you back to where you were before. Um, so again, since we only care about the green, we're going to filter for just the green. So at the filter at the top here, we're just going to type TCP. TCP is, is again, another um, protocol. So once we click TCP, uh, on the right here, so it shows like the color codes, like, but like, you know, much more compressed view. See all this green here? We're going to go to that. So we want to click at the very top of that. So we want to go to the top of when that started. And then you'll see something like this. So now we're dealing with like all of the HTTP related um, traffic, essentially. So um, I'm looking here, and I can see again another HTTP request. This one's different from the other one that we saw. Uh, it's making a get request to a very suspicious looking um, sort of uh, domain and like file path to that. that does, that's just like random gibberish. So um, a good example of this, so if this is like um, sort of how a bad, almost a, a sort of bad form of C2 would form is because if I'm a network um, engineer and I see a request going up to this random, long looking, suspicious uh, URL, I'm gonna think it's traffic. But let's say you saw that I was Spotify.com, you're not gonna think much of it. So if you were to use like the tool that I had, it looked a lot more um, normal in terms of traffic. But now that we've seen this looks very suspicious, we're now going to check it out. So again, we're going to do right click on it, follow, and do TCP stream. And so here we had a lot more data, just tons. Um, so what we're going to see here is if you look even at the, like, the very top of it here, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Um, that is a pretty clear indication that it's some sort of executable. Um, so for those who don't know, DOS is like, what is it, like the main, like the original OS for Windows or something like that? <laughs> I've never used it. Basically the original, the very old OS used for Windows, uh, but it's still like, it's it's not used anymore basically, but um, execute, a lot of executables will have that sort of one at the top saying uh, an error. So if you tried to run that in DOS, it'll output, this program cannot uh, be run in DOS mode. Um, so if you see something like that, it's a clear sign that it's an exe file and executable. Um, and so executables are what you're looking for in traffic like this because someone downloading an executable is mo a lot of times very suspicious. So we think that this is the initial point that the, um, that the uh, computer got infected. So we can see here at the top, um, this is sort of all the metadata related to the actual request. If we look closely here, there's a date right here. This is the time at which it was downloaded at. So this is most likely the time at which the initial infection occurred. So that would be the, the answer to our first question, which is what date and time did the infection activity start? Oh. Oh, here, okay, yeah. So that's what we can say it was in the initial, so we can most likely presume that's when the initial infection occurred. So that's when um, the computer started downloading the executable file. Any questions on like how I figured that out or how I saw that? Okay, cool. So we have the answer to the first question. Let's close this. Let's look at the next one. So what is the IP address of the Windows infected host? This one's a lot easier based off what I uh, was explaining before with each of these. Um, 
So we have two IPs here, the source and the destination. Or sorry, wrong question. Yeah, the source and the destination here. Now, based off this, can anyone tell me what the, uh, the IP of the infected computer would be? I know it's hard to read, but if you can see it on your own computer, maybe I can zoom in. The 172 address, exactly. Because that's the um, that is the IP that was um, made the request to that website. So this 160.153.137.48 is um, most likely a malicious IP. Um, so, so this would be the IP of the uh, Windows host that was infected. So that was that's the answer for our second question, which is what is the IP of the Windows host infected? Um, so what is the MAC address? So I'll briefly explain what a MAC address is. So there's an IP address and there's a MAC address. IP address is used um, when you're communicating um, between computers on many different networks, essentially. Um, a MAC address is used for communication on a single network. Um, so essentially every computer has a unique MAC address, also known as a hardware address. Um, it's you like every computer in the entire world should have a unique um, MAC address. Um, but IPs can be reassigned and changed all the time. Your MAC address, for the most part, never changes throughout the, the entire time that you have your computer. It's like, oh, it's basically, it's not, I won't say it's hard code on the computer, but it's basically hard code on the computer where it should not be changed. Um, so that's what MAC address is. And actually with every, with all of these um, packets that we're looking at here, we can view the MAC address of the IP because each IP will have an associated MAC address. So we click on the, uh, we're still highlighting the HTTP request. And if you view down here, it shows the specifics of that packet. So um, if we look like hypertext transfer protocol, it gives us like, this is the host that it was making the, uh, the request out to. So uh, that's the web, that's the malicious website, piece of passion.net. Um, and so if we look here and we go to the source here, this is what a MAC address looks like. It follows this sort of format where it's like a letters and numbers um, in pairs with colons in between. And then we have, again, we have a source and a destination MAC address, just like we had a source and a destination IP. So uh, based off this here, what do you think the uh, MAC address of the infected Windows host is? Based off these two. Yes, the BA one, exactly. Because again, just like with how we, it was the source IP with uh, the IP address, it's the source MAC address for this one. So that answers our next, our, our what is the MAC address question? So the MAC address is this BA97-5A34CD91. Yeah, any questions on like why we're talking general or like what I've been doing or why I've been doing it? Anything like that? Yeah, so quick recap. Um, we, we viewed all of the, um, Basically, HTTP traffic that was all green. We filtered it by just typing TCP at the top, and then went down to all the green packets. Uh, we grabbed the first one that looked suspicious because it had a bunch of random characters here in the uh, in the request bar. And so we clicked on that, and we followed the TCP stream to see the specific all the data that was being sent um, through. And we saw we determined that it was an executable because it had something related to DOS in the actual um, transfer of it. So we knew that was probably the infected, um, the, that's when the infection was starting. Um, and then we wanted to figure out what IP was getting infected. So we just looked at, literally just looked at the source IP. And then we wanted to figure out what the uh, MAC address was for that. So we just did the same thing. We just clicked on the packet and looked at the source MAC address. So the, the Windows machine that was infected had an IP of 172.16.2.197 and it had the MAC address of B897. 5A, 34, CD, 91. So that's that's the information that we know about currently about the infected uh, Windows computer. Okay, so we'll go to the next question. So what is the host name of the infected Windows host? Um, so this one, basically what we're doing here is we're trying to find out everything we can about the infected machine so we can basically find it and then fix it. So we want to figure out what the host name is. Um, this is where it gets a bit trickier uh, to kind of um, explain, but I'll go into, so there's something called Kerberos. 
Um, Kerberos is what is used on Windows to, um, whenever you, if you log into like one of these computers here, and it, it, it successfully logs you in, um, what it's doing is it's using Kerberos to authenticate you. Because the password for your, for, so when you log in there, right, the password isn't checked against the computer, the physical computer that's sitting right in front of you. Your password is being sent to the, the UF servers, and then UF servers are checking, okay, this person is this person, sends back, you're good. That's used, that Kerberos is what does that whole process, right? So with, um, when you're sending those credentials, you're sending your username and your, your password, right? Um, so we can actually see that, that transfer of information happening, that uh, sort of the, uh, the login, the credentials being sent on Wireshark here. Um, and so to do that, if we go to the uh, top bar here and type Kerberos, I'm just calling that one, Kerberos, we can see here, the protocol being used here is KRB5, which is short for Kerberos, like version five or something like that. Uh, so we know that we're on the right thing. And now what we're gonna do here is basically just click on one of the packets and then again, do follow TCP stream to view sort of all the data related to it. And now we get mostly garbage, but as you can see there, I'll try to zoom in. Okay, I can't zoom in. But if, you, if you're looking at it on your own screen, you can see that there's actually some English words there. Um, so there's some stuff like tinsolutions.net. Um, and then we have some English here. And so what we can actually see here is the host name of the computer, which is this right here. So this is like, if you can't see that, it says um, Burgess-Win7-PC. Um, so that would be the host name of our computer. And the only reason I know that is because that sort of follows the basic formatting for what most Windows host names are, would be. It would be like um, the name of, you know, the name associated with that computer, dash the OS, dash like PC or something like that. So that's how I know that's the Windows host name. So that's how I know that's the host name of the computer that was infected because that's who logged into that computer. So for the question, yeah, what is the host name of the infected Windows host? We know that the host name is... Burgess. Here we go. Is Burgess, yeah, dash win, seven dash PC is the host name. So that answers that question. And we can actually use the same stuff we have currently open to see what the user account name is. So can anyone tell me, based off this, um, who logged into this computer? What's their name? What's their full name? Theodore Burgess, exactly. Uh, and you can actually see that here because his name is right there. It says Theodore.Burgess. That was the person who logged into this account. So now we, we know the IP, the MAC address of the computer, and who logged into it, or who's just logged into it, and the host name of that computer. So that answers those questions, right? So those have been all the um, mostly Wireshark related questions. Um, so I'll do a quick, if anyone have any questions about Wireshark in general or what we've been doing, um, please feel free to ask. I definitely want you guys to learn as much as you can. Um, but yeah. So I'll go ahead and close this now. So the next question is, what type of malware was, uh, was the host infected with? This one is tricky because um, unless you sort of are familiar with current malware on the internet, it's difficult to determine what it is. Um, but luckily there's a couple ways we can do it that makes it a lot easier. So with Wireshark, the really cool thing you can do is that not only can we analyze the packets, we can actually put them back together and download whatever was being sent over it, if there was being sent over it. So we know that an executable was being downloaded because we saw that in our previous wire capture. Um, we're gonna go ahead and try to download that and view it. So I'm gonna clear the, um, the filter here. And I'm gonna go back to the top of the green to find that HTTP request I was looking for. So we're back to this guy, right? Now, actually we didn't have to do that, but I said anyway just to show you guys. So we're back here, um, you don't have to be. But with Wireshark, if you click on File, and then you go to um, Export Objects, 
and then you click on um, HTTP, it'll show you the different files that were um, either downloaded or you know seen, anything like that. Um, so we can see here is the file, the weird looking file, right? So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna download that file. Um, don't run it though, because that would be, probably wouldn't be a good idea. But we're gonna safely download it in our VM. And I'm just gonna save it to here. So does everyone gather this part where they have to download um, the file? So um, you guys want to, okay, so now you guys are going to want to open up a, um, a terminal. Uh, so in Kali, you just so you click on activities on the top left, and then there's a red box on the left-hand side, the very top. If you click on that, that should open up a terminal for you guys. Um, let's see. So... So we have this, right? We don't want to run it. Um, but what we want to do is figure out if it's malware or not. We definitely don't want to run it. Um, although this, this, I'm on a Mac, so it wouldn't have run it. I dare you. I bet. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is actually get the hash of this file. What the hash, so what a hash is, is essentially um, it's an encryption uh, that's used, um, it's mostly used, or used a lot, if you're like um, encrypting, you're, you're hiding a password so they're not all in plain text on a server or on a computer. We're gonna use it to develop a unique ID for this file, because um, every hash um, is different if the content that you're hashing is different in any way. So if I, if I try to hash the word hello, right, and it gives me a, a long hash, a long string of random numbers, if I hash hello again, it's gonna be the same string of numbers, right? Nothing's gonna change. But if I put hello and then a T at the end, I'm gonna get a completely different string of numbers. So hashing, uh, a side effect, I guess, or a good thing about hashing is that it gives you a unique ID for any different, every unique input will give you a unique ID. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hash the file to get a long string, which will be our unique ID. And there's actually tools online that you can upload that hash to, and it will cross-reference that with the list of hashes that it has to see if it matches any malware, malware that has existed on the public internet, and it'll tell us everything we need to know about what type of malware it is, um, what kind of you know antivirus it would get past or wouldn't get past, um, a bunch of metadata stuff, all that. So that's what we're gonna do to figure out uh, what, time, what kind of malware it is. So the command to do that, uh, do you guys have OpenSSL installed? So on the terminal, can you guys type OpenSSL-H and see, do you guys get like command not found or do you get?
So um, does everyone have the, um, the executable downloaded on my computer? If you don't, let me know. I'll make sure to get malware downloaded on your computer. All right, cool. So um, if you guys do have OpenSSL, so I hope you guys do. Um, I'll, I'll just show it here actually again. So to download it, when you're in um, when you're in Wireshark like this, you want to click on File. You want to click on the File icon, go down to Export Objects, and then click on HTTP. And then this window will pop up, and you just want to you want to highlight the one that has the really long string for the file name, and you just want to do Save, and then it'll it'll download that file for you, and you can put it wherever you want. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, can anyone verify that OpenSSL is installed? On OpenSSL is one word. Just one word, right? OpenSSL is one word. Yes. Yeah. Is that installed on everyone's tally box? Yes. You guys can type it on the computer. So all that does is just pop up. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, space dash. Dash HTTPS. Okay, so it is. That's awesome. All right, so you guys just want to type this command. Hold on, zoom in. So you want to type, I don't know if it's hard to see, but you want to type OpenSSL space DGST space dash SHA256 and then the name of the file, which in our case is going to be... Um, a27. So this is what your command should look like. One last slice. And so once you run that, you'll get this long string here. And that's what your hash is. Okay? So you want to copy that. Well, has everyone gotten to this point where they will get the, the hash of their executable? Almost okay, cool. Let me know if you haven't gotten the hash and I'll come around and help. Okay, I'll take that as everyone has a hash. Okay. If you guys are getting like a file not found issue or anything like that, um, it could be that you're not in the current directory where your file is. Yeah, so if you guys didn't found not found, um, make, if you guys put it into your downloads folder, which I'm, I'm assuming most of you guys did, you want to type this command. CD space tilde, tilde slash and then downloads. And then try the open SSL command again. And then that should work. Is anyone still getting, like, they haven't gotten their hash or their... Having final not found issues? So now, if you have the hash, you want to copy it to your clipboard, whatever. And then you want to uh, open up a uh, open up your browser. I think for Cali, it's Ice Weasel. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. The hash. Okay. So hashing is. Uh, most commonly used in uh, authentication, keeping your passwords uh, private, so they're not like stored in plain text on your computer, on like a database server or anything like that. Because uh, if you saw that, that's not a password, it's just a hash of the password. You couldn't reverse engineer that to find the password, right? Um, what it's also useful for in our case is finding a unique ID for our file. Because uh, like I was saying before, if I were to hash the word hello, I'd get a long string like that, right? It wouldn't look like that, though. It would be slightly different, but it'd be similar to that. And then if 
I hashed hello again, I'd get the same exact string. If I, had, if I hashed uh, uh, hello with a T at the end, I'd get a completely different hash, right? Because I've entered a, a, a different word, right? So instead of entering a word, and we're not hashing a word this time, we're gonna hash a file and everything in that file, right? Um, and so that's gonna give us a unique ID for that file. So no other file in the entire world, unless it's the exact same file, will have that same hash. So now that we have that, right, we basically have a unique ID for this file. Um, there are databases online that people have um, created, essentially, where you can run a search on that hash, and they'll check it against their database for malware that they have stored on their computer, and they're checking the hash, if the hash will match up, it means they have that malware on their computer, and they have a bunch of information related to that, and they'll just spit it back out to you. And they'll tell you everything there is to know about that malware. Um, so has everyone, everyone's gotten the hash here? Yeah. Okay, so once you have the hash, you copy it. We're gonna go to, uh, you're gonna open your browser in Kali. Because you won't be able to, I don't think you can copy over on uh, You cannot. You cannot, so yeah, you wanna open up Ice Weasel on your Kali. If you go to activities and then type Ice, start typing Ice, Ice Weasel should pop up. Um, but once you have that opened up, you wanna go to something called virustotal.com. You can just Google it and get the first link. And VirusTotal is a great website that lets you upload either malware files itself or the hashes of those files or even URLs. And it'll check against its massive database that it has to see if it could potentially be malware. Right? So we're going to click on search here because we don't want to upload the file, we just want to upload the hash. And then we just want to paste the hash that we have and then hit enter. And you can see there we have that red. That means that it's Probably malware. Anyone, has anyone, everyone gotten to this point? Or has everyone, like, can't get to this point and needs help? The network can be really slow when you're trying to connect virusworld.com. Uh, so you can't use like the minimal interface to give you the option to. And it, it's basically the same thing. If, if you get in that area where it's like taking forever to load. Yeah, you basically, when you get to the virusworld website, you want to click on the little search where it says search, and then it'll give you an option to enter in uh, text, and you just paste in your hash, and then hit enter. So I'll go back to the main virusworld website. So if you get here, yeah, once you get here, you just want to click on search, and then just paste in your hash. And this will give you what you're looking for. Would you be able to use other ways, like checksum? That can be good. Checksum is like the Okay, so if everyone's gotten to this point, we'll look at the output, the data it has here. So what it has here is basically, on the left-hand side is, I, like, a, I believe, a bunch of uh, like detection software that, um, that, that it just exists, that analyzes malware and checks for stuff like that. Um, and then right here shows you what the, um, the output of that software gave you. 
So like the first one told you it was suspicious. The next one told you this is definitely a Trojan. The next one is Trojan, Trojan. You see a lot of Trojans there. Um, so, and then next to that again is, I'm actually not sure what that column is. Oh yeah, sorry, it's just split in two lists. Okay, yeah. So it's just split in two there. Okay, so it's just like, yeah, the software that you detected and the output from it. Um, so we can even, if we click on the details tab, we can even see like more stuff related to it. We can see all the hash checks sums up and all the hashes of the file. Um, related names to that, executable. And just a bunch of like file version, a bunch of stuff. So we basically can find out everything we need to know about this malware, and yeah. So now, um, I guess I'll talk about, so malware is very popular on the internet, if you didn't know. It's like, I'm writing one. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's popular in the fact that even, like, there are well-known malware out there. So it's not just like, oh, this is malware. It's like there's actually, no, this is a specific malware that this, guy, that this guy or this group of, this team of people came up with. Or girl. Or girl, or anyone, any hacker group from any country um, came up with that um, is like really, really sophisticated and like is just spreading across the entire internet and infecting a lot of machines. Uh, so they get, they basically get, they get coin names because they're so like well known in what they do. Um, yeah. So, no, it can't do that because um, essentially uh, that would be amazing, or not amazing, it would be, it would be really terrifying if it could do that. Um, but luckily it can because it's like, because you're not running the executable, so nothing's, nothing's being executed, right? So we, when we ran OpenSSL on that file, we didn't execute that file. I didn't, that file was not executed or did anything, right? We're just basically checking the contents of it and putting it into a hash, right? So there's no way for that file to alter its own hash. Yeah, and they do that. Um, that's very common thing to do where they'll just like, they'll change it, they might change each one in some way. I, they can even add like a single letter to the end of it and that changes the hash completely. And so in that sense, that would, in a lot of a lot of ways, like completely uh, negate this in a sense uh, because it's completely unique. Um, so yeah, that's why there's other. That's why virus total and checking the hash isn't the only way to identify malware. There's a lot of other stuff that does as well, like running it in a sandbox, see what it does, all that stuff. I'm um, analyzing the functions of it, all that. This is just one way to help identify malware. Um, so yeah, uh, so like I was saying, uh, malware is, like certain malware is very well known in what it can do, and so they have different names. Um, can anyone tell me names of malware they've heard of before? Mostly because I'm blanking on them, huh? Stuxnet is not, um, Stuxnet, it, it's, <coughs> Stuxnet was developed by the government actually, that was targeted for a specific um, target, which, are, which in that case was Israel, I believe, or not Israel, Iran, sorry, I'm zero with it. it's Iran, and they use that to basically, sh like, just, not destroy, like, like, shut down and ruin their entire nuclear sort of thing they had going on there, and um, so that wasn't, um, that was a type of malware, you're right, so that's a, it's well, it's a well-known one, thanks, um, but what malware we're talking about here is one that's being run on the public internet, that's it's like, attacking, like, innocent computers and, like, all that stuff. But yeah, Stuxnet's a good example of a type of malware. It's just like, I think it's like the most sophisticated piece of code that people, I think that's what people say. It's very sophisticated. Um, and the source code's not actually been released, so no one actually knows the source code of it. But yeah, that's a good example of like a really sophisticated piece of malware. WannaCry. WannaCry is a very um, popular malware. I'm sure you guys have at least heard of it before. Um, any any other ones? Crypto Wall. Crypto Wall. I haven't heard of that one myself. But. Crypto Locker. Crypto Locker is a good one. Hmm? Mems. 
I've personally heard that one, but I, I, I bet it exists. I mean, there's a name for everything. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different names for that malware. And so if we go back to the, what the question was asking, it was asking, what type of malware is a host infected with? So we're basically looking for that name, that common name, so that the network engineer knows, okay, this computer was infected with WannaCry or CryptoLocker or whatever. So based off virus total and what these are outputting, um, not all of these are outputting the, um, the name of this malware, but some of them are. Based off reading this right now, can anyone tell me what the uh, malware is? Uh, so it's not Trojan. Trojan is a type of malware. Um, it's not like a common name for one. Uh, but there is there. There is. Not Banker X. Um, Emotet. That would be the one. Uh, so I think the other ones who were saying like Banker X and Casted could have been a false positive that certain software were running against. Because those probably at least sound like other malware. So very well could be that it's identifying that. Um, and it's just not doing a great job of it. But if you see, like on the fifth or sixth one, it calls it Emotet, or that's the third one, it calls it Emotet. That is the malware that is actually being, uh, that got downloaded and infected this computer. Um, Emotet is a pretty popular malware. Um, it basically gets initially sent through email, and then once you when it, once it infects a host, it, um, it takes over that host and then sends that same malware to all of the contacts on that uh, computer's um, email. And it just spreads that way. So it sends it, like if I infected this computer and, and then I also just send that email to all of my contacts on the email, which would be like maybe 100, 200 plus people, they would all get that email and maybe only like five or six of them actually get infected. That's all I need, because then those ones get um, their email taken over and it gets sent to the next, all those contacts. And so it spreads pretty viciously. Um, but yeah, that's what Emotet is, and that's what this malware was identified as, um, according to virus total. Any questions on malware in general, or um, how we figured out that it was Emotet? Cool. So this last one here um, is which email was responsible for kicking off this infection activity? So um, in the zip files that I told you guys to download, uh, we actually didn't need the, alert, the alerts one, you guys can delete that one. But there is an email one that has emails on it. I believe it has three emails. Uh, yeah, so it has these three emails here, like uh, payment confirmation, uh, email deadline, and uh, FedEx delivery notification. So these are the three suspected emails that could have infected our computer. We're gonna try to figure out which one it was. So um, we'll start with um, start with the deadline one. So it's a .email file. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are able to open .emails in Linux. Oh yeah, sorry, the password zip didn't type again. No, no, uh, no. Actually, I'm time. I'll go through just the one that is definitely the malware. Yeah. All right, so. We're actually gonna look at um, not the deadline one. We're just gonna look at the one that we know, or that I know is the infected one, which is um, payment confirmation. Um, and I don't know if you guys are able to open emails in Linux. If you can't, oh, does it come with the attached file though? Because there's a text file with this email, and I'm not sure if the TXT, I don't think it will show that, right? Um, that's okay, I'll just show this last part here um, because it might take a while for you guys to get like email set up on all this. So um, I open up the email and it says, please see attached, and we see an online payment doc. So I'm gonna save this file to my computer so I can analyze it. Um, take a second. All right, so now that I have it saved, <coughs> sorry, um, I'm gonna go to a site called, or did I already forget the name of it? Um, my bad, I already forgot the name. Um, let me see. It's called
called app.any.run. And what this site is, I haven't used it too much, only a little bit, but it lets you, um, basically the same thing with, a uh, similar thing with VirusTotal, where you can check the, search the hash for it, and then see what sort of, um, see what, if there's any malware on it or what it can do. Um, except what it also does is that it actually has um, sandbox environments that let people run the malware on that, sam on that sandbox. A sandbox is like a virtual uh, computer. So if you were to run it, run the malware in that um, virtual computer, it wouldn't affect your physical host. So it's like a safe place to be able to run malware. Uh, so this site lets you actually upload malware to be run on a sandbox to see what that malware does. Um, so what we're gonna do here is um, I've got the the online dot, online payment dot doc that I downloaded. Um, I got the hash of it here, just like I did with the other one. I'm gonna copy that hash. I'm gonna go to public tasks, and I'm gonna type the hash in here and do a search for it. And she's a few matches. That means that people um, have actually run this same malware on on this on this site. And it was recorded, and like everything it did was recorded, essentially. So we're gonna click on the first one here because it matches the same name as our file. Click on malware activity, and what we're gonna do here is actually screenshot of um, what's happening when you open up the Word doc. So you can see here we just we're just going through it essentially, and it basically gives you a little. It's giving you a prompt saying. Um, to view the content, please enable content. And for you guys who don't know, um, sending malware over a, um, a Word document, um, there's basically one challenge uh, to get over when it comes to that, and that's forcing the user to click enable content. Right? Once they click that, you, it's, you, you own that computer, basically. Uh, so a lot of malware do something like this, will they'll block the actual content of the Word document and shows a little like pop up here that says, in order to view the content, please click enable content, which is usually like a, a bright yellow bar at the very top that says enable content. And so it's very enticing and a lot of people will click on that. And once they do, you're basically owned. So that's what it's doing here. Uh, and once, they're able to, once they enable content, um, they, it now has full control of the computer. So you can see at the bottom here, these are the, the requests that the malware is, or that the Word document is making out to the internet. Now, Word documents for the most part, unless it's doing like update stuff, shouldn't be making requests out to the internet. <laughs> Especially to someone to get down powershell.exe or to like pieceofpassion.net, which isn't like, that's not a legitimate website. So uh, from here we can see that this was definitely the email that started the infection um, on that computer. Any questions on this site or how they able to see the malware and what it does or anything like that? This is a great site for analyzing malware, app.any.run. Any questions? Okay, cool, so that, that will end the presentation. If you have any questions afterwards, feel free to come up. I can explain the tool I made or command and control or malware in general, anything Wireshark. Um, yeah, thank you. Red team meeting tomorrow, if you want to learn more about this kind of cool stuff. Well, similar stuff. Yeah, meeting tomorrow at 6.30. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming. I hope you guys had a great time. Another round of applause for John for taking such a, making such a great lecture. Uh, so like I said, if you're, like he said, if you're interested in participating in any of our other events, we have practices almost every day of the week except Tuesday and Thursday because we have this meeting. So uh, yeah, just keep an eye on the Slack. Uh, I always pin uh, Slato's announcements, which is on here to the left of it. Uh, and that will show all our meeting times and uh, meeting dates. So if you're interested in doing red teaming, that's on Friday. CTFs are on Wednesday and sometimes Friday. And um, blue team is on Mondays. So, which is defense. So yeah, thank you guys for coming out again. Have a good day. <laughs>
Oh wait, did we talk about 40 already? Uh, no, we did not. Yeah, I was I need to ask us to 